Uh, our last speaker, last but certainly not least, um, is our friend and colleague, Dr. Kelsey Mills. Uh, Dr. Mills is an OBGYN in Victoria and a clinical associate professor at the University of British Columbia and an affiliate associate professor at the University of Victoria. Uh, Dr. Mills completed a fellowship in mature women's health and menopause in Toronto and obtained her master's of science in health science and education at McMaster. Dr. Mills has been a Menopause Society certified practitioner since 2013 and has previously won the Sigma Young Canadian Menopause Scholar Award, the NAMS Tiva Women's Health Residence Excellent Award, and the NAMS New Investigator Award. She is a board member of the Canadian Menopause Society and a member of the uh, Clinical Sexual and Reproductive Health Committee for the Guideline Management and Oversight Committee as an expert in menopause and a founding Medical Advisory Board member of the Menopause Foundation of Canada. So we're so pleased to have Dr. Mills here. It's always a hotly requested topic, <laughs> unintended. Um, menopause, a review of the routine and complex case management. So I will have Dr. Mills go ahead and share your screen. Thank you so much. And thank you to Dr. Dunn for the kind invitation to speak today. Um, always a pleasure to talk about anything hormone. Um, and I will certainly share my screen. I just want to, of course, acknowledge that I'm coming to you today from uh, Victoria, British Columbia, and I wish to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the traditional and unceded territories of the Lekwungen peoples, including the Esquimalt, Songhees, and Wasanish First Nations. Uh, and I always mention at the top of any presentation that I will likely use uh, the terms women or female when discussing menopause and the transition. Uh, and that's for simplicity of language and acknowledging that the vast majority of our studies are done on white women who identify as cisgender. But of course, I wish to acknowledge that gender is a spectrum. And if there are any specific questions about um, care of our trans, queer, gender non-binary population, I'm always happy to take those as well. Uh, so let me see what I can do. I'm the first to admit that sometimes this takes me a try or two to get this right. <laughs> uh, let me see here. Slideshow. Play from start. Maybe Caitlin can tell me if that looks good. I can't. So quite. What I would recommend is um, at the very bottom, mm -hmm. if you just go to the very, very bottom on the right. Mm hmm. Um, and then there's just to the left of the minus button. I would press that just at the very bottom on the right. Don't see that. See, see there's the zoom button where you can make your slides bigger and smaller. Oh, just go with that. Sure. Uh, and then go to the, see the, see there's a little, it looks like a computer, like a computer screen. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, just uh, over, over to the, uh, to the left of the minus button. Uh, you're almost there. Just. To the right one, and uh, there, yeah, press that. I think I did before. What does that look like? No. Maybe, do you have two screens on right now? I don't. Let me just see. Let me stop the share for a minute. I uh, humbly acknowledge that this does happen sometimes. I just recently gave a talk and it took me a second or two to uh, get this to go. That is the... Let me try presenter view. Can you see the next slide also there? Yeah, I think you need to go the whole to thing. the slide show, yeah. You know what, let me do this then. Maybe I will just, hmm. <laughs> it's so funny, this, this does happen. Let me try one more thing. Maybe if you click play from current slide. Okay, what about this? that there we go perfect better yay excellent okay here we go all right so <laughs> that's just my fun graphic to start uh so these are my disclosures i did not receive any pharmaceutical funding for this lecture i had full editorial control um, i'll identify if i'm recommending any um, medications that are off-label use and, and i do do uh, work for different pharmaceutical companies so 30 minutes for this talk is not a long time, but of course, menopause is. And what I thought I would do is, uh, you know, Dr. Dunn said maybe some sort of routine cases and then maybe some more challenging cases because I can see that there are a wide variety of practitioners in the audience. So I'll hope to sort of touch on as much as I can. 
So here's the first case. So this is Ms. X. She's a healthy 51-year-old Gravita 3 para 2 woman who presents with frequent and significant hot flashes, night sweats, sleep disturbance, irritability. She covers the whole gamut. And her final menstrual period was 13 months ago. Uh, she tells you that she has struggled with her symptoms and was told to eat more soy and see if that fixes everything. Uh, she has purchased some hormone balancing vitamins from Instagram uh, because her social media knows how old she is, but she hasn't noticed much of a change. She's had two vaginal deliveries, no significant medical history, or um, take, she doesn't take any medications. Her routine screening is up to date and unremarkable. She denies any substance use, and she says, just give me something to manage these hot flashes. And I think for a lot of us, this is very bread and butter um, I would consider primary care of women or people experiencing menopause, but I am the first to admit that menopause medicine sort of exists within a bit of a black box uh, within gynecology. And so I think it's, it's very reasonable if a primary care provider, a family doctor, nurse practitioner has some hesitancy when a patient arrives in their office and says, you know, do something to help me. But I think any of us who have female patients uh, have probably met this person. And if you haven't in your practice, then you probably have a friend, a mother or an aunt who maybe has had challenges in menopause. So I think it's important to first start just to get everybody on the same page in terms of what is menopause, uh, because you hear a lot of terms, perimenopause, menopause transition. I have patients who tell me all the time, I'm done with menopause. I'm through it. Uh, and the point is, is that once you experience menopause, you live in that reproductive stage for the rest of your life. Um, menopause for the vast majority of people is a normal, natural and spontaneous event diagnosed retrospectively after their final menstrual period. Uh, and it is only a retrospective diagnosis. So that's important. Um, and it results from a loss of ovarian follicular function. On average, women will experience this at age 51 and a half. And because of our longevity, women can be expected to live a third or even a half of our lives in menopause. So I tell learners who come through my clinic, you know, we have to have an approach to this. Um, this isn't an, an esoteric medical diagnosis that you're never going to encounter. And of course, it's important to recognize that some people will go through menopause prematurely due to doctor causes like bilateral ovary, ovary removal or chemotherapy or radiation. Um, and some people can have early menopause due to impaired ovarian function due to other causes like autoimmune disease, genetic conditions, and a large group of people going through early menopause uh, we don't yet quite understand why that's happened to them. Uh, and these are people that it's really important for us to identify. And so this is for those of us who love hormones and love levels. This, I think, is such an elegant representation of what happens. So as women on average approach the final menstrual period, which is time zero, uh, we start to see this upswing quite steeply on an asymptote of the follicle stimulating hormone level, which almost perfectly mirrors uh, the fall off of the estradiol level. And so it is this fall off of the estradiol level over time that contributes to many, not all, but many of the symptoms that we can talk about. And I also think it's important that, that we understand that menopause can have a myriad of different presentations. So our case, this woman has pretty classic symptoms, hot flashes, night sweats, she's not sleeping, she feels irritable. Um, but, you know, there are some people that just present with mood. There are some people that just present with joint pain um, who only manifest vulvovaginal dryness. And so we have to kind of expand our radar. Uh, certainly the hallmark of menopause are beta, vasomotor symptoms. This, these are experienced by up to 80% of all people going through menopause. We know that severe VMS are associated with poor overall health status, loss of work productivity, and this is a huge movement right now in Canada and Europe. Um, definitely impaired quality of life. And we're learning that people who have severe vasomotor symptoms, this can also be an adverse possible cardiac marker in their future. And I have permission to show this. This is one of my patients who showed me, she documented, I think she felt she needed proof that she was worthy of treatment, um, but she documented every time she had a vasomotor event in a 24 hour period. 
And so I put this here uh, because it's important for us to understand that this is not a trivial topic. Uh, this is not something, you know, that is okay to just sort of uh, sweep people aside and say, you'll get through it, go eat some soy. Uh, I can't imagine trying to have a uh, productive, high functioning, um, effective life uh, as a professional, as a mother, as a partner, um, and have this amount of disturbance in my life. So this is, um, you know, an important thing when your patients are saying, I have terrible vasomotor symptoms, this is what they're talking about. And so how could you have any type of quality sleep with this? But of course, menopause is more than just hot flashes. And we talked about some of some of the things that our patient in the first case has. But I would like to draw your attention to, you know, the cognitive complaints of brain fog, word finding difficulties, difficulty retrieving um, nouns or names. Uh, people talk about sleep as a massive impairment during this transition. Uh, joint stiffness is a huge one that has been underreported for a long time. Palpitations and new onset cardiac discomfort is often associated. Um, breast changes and nostalgia and then a very uh, significant mood component as well. So um, menopause and menopausal symptoms can be many things. And, you know, I, I want to share today that, of course, hormone therapy, and when I say hormone therapy, I mean systemic hormones taken through the skin or by mouth are the gold standard for management of vasomotor symptoms. So women do not have to try and fail conservative measures or non-hormonal options to be offered hormone therapy. The uh, previously known North American Menopause Society, which is now the Menopause Society, had a 2022 uh, position statement on hormone therapy and states quite clearly that it is the most effective treatment for managing vasomotor symptoms and GSM, which stands for genitourinary syndrome of menopause, which I will go into more detail about. And that if you are symptomatic, the benefits of using hormone therapy are most likely to outweigh risks for women who initiate under age 60 or within 10 years of the menopause onset. Full stop. So we can use hormone therapy safely and comfortably. We use it at very low doses here in Canada, um, generally one fifth to one sixth of what is in a single oral contraceptive tablet. Uh, and so we can use this confidently as a gold standard for treatment. The vast majority of women might take this for a few years, manage their treatments and come off. And so uh, this is a safe option. I want to show, of course, there are those of us in this audience who will either remember the Women's Health Initiative trial or be uh, aware of what this trial was. This was a very large randomized control trial looking at people who took hormone therapy um, uh, versus people who did not. And there, it is a heavily criticized trial. There are large problems with it, notwithstanding the fact that they recruited women who did not have hot flashes and that they gave um, big doses of synthetic hormones to women up to age uh, in the mid seventies. So uh, basically there was a point where this trial was stopped. And what I wanna draw your attention to is that uh, at the time the trial was stopped, uh, sort of at that May 2002 time point, you saw a dramatic and sudden fall off in hormone therapy use. And then uh, what women were started on that mirrored it perfectly uh, were antidepressants. So I put this here to show that uh, when women don't have access to hormone therapy to treat their symptoms um, and to treat the source of their symptoms, uh, women are put on uh, antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications. And when they're treated with hormone therapy, uh, we certainly can reduce that use. And I think it's also important because people have reticence about prescribing hormone therapy. And I hear people say, I'm going to have a heart attack. Um, and that uh, was something that came up in this trial. But what I draw your attention to on this forest plot is the hazard ratio for mortality from a cardiac event. Um, and the green bar is all trial participants who are between the ages of 50 and 59, who showed possibly even improved hazard uh, rate, ratio for mortality. So how I interpret this is that when we are giving hormone therapy to symptomatic, young, 
healthy women under the age of 60, you know, the author of this study in JAMA said, and I paraphrase, you can essentially take the cardiac concerns off the table. And so I think that this is a quite a reassuring reanalysis of the WHI in terms of heart concerns. The one thing I counsel my patients about when I start uh, hormone therapy is breast cancer risk, because I would say that this is the number one thing I think of as a clinician, understanding that one in eight Canadian women will be diagnosed with a breast cancer in their lifetime. I want my patients to know that after five years of use of combined estrogen and progestogen, the Women's Health Initiative did see a small but statistically significant relationship between breast cancer and hormone therapy use. Uh, and so we will never have that study retrialed. Uh, so it's some of the best and biggest data sets that we have. So I counsel people about breast cancer. And I counsel them also because it is the most common cancer that women have. And so I want people to be fully informed uh, that this may be playing slightly into their risk uh, if they stay on it for a long time. Now, breast cancer, of course, is multifactorial. And you can see, you know, down at the far right, that using combined hormone therapy for more than five years is a similar added additional risk for breast cancer to having a BMI greater than 35 at the menopause transition or to using two standard units of alcohol per day, which many of our patients do. Um, so those are possibly modifiable risk factors. And in the scheme of things, the World Health Organization deemed the use of, of hormone therapy to be a very um, rare association with breast cancer. But I still counsel people every time I write the prescription. What's another important counseling point for this patient, who, in my opinion, is a good candidate to try um, is that we don't change the frequency or type of breast screening when we initiate hormone therapy because it doesn't have a big enough impact on overall risk. So we are still recommending mammography uh, every two years, whether somebody's on hormone therapy or not. And the reason we think that breast cancer is impacted by hormone therapy, and we know you know, and this is a big deep dive, that there are differences in different types of hormone therapy in terms of their impact on breast, but that it has to do with breast density, where we know that the denser the breast tissue, the increased uh, percentage chance of breast cancer exists, whether it's because it's harder for us to see the breast tumors with denser breasts, true, or whether it's because there's a relationship between density and neoplasia. Uh, but specifically, we are coming to understand that the use of synthetic progestins, specifically medroxyprogesterone acetate, are probably the least breast friendly, and that using something like micronized progesterone, um, using estrogen alone in a hysterectomized woman, or considering a different product altogether like tibolone or a tissue selective estrogen complex, which I'll talk about, are other additional options for hormone therapy that are safer for breast. Of course, we're always thinking when we're prescribing about what the possible contraindications to hormone therapy might be. Many of these are very similar, um, you know, that, that we know in our, in our minds already. Uh, what I want to draw your attention to is that hormone therapy is not a birth control pill. And so smoking, diabetes, well-controlled hypertension, migraine, these are not absolute contraindications, unlike with use of oral contraceptive pill. I have many patients who have well-controlled hypertension or diabetes or who even smoke who are taking hormone therapy. And because they have vascular risk factors, I prefer a transdermal gel or patch for their estrogen delivery, um, but they are, it is not an absolute contraindication. And I appreciate that one of the challenges with, with prescribing is that there are so many options. And if you're a family doctor, I don't know how you learn all of the different diabetes medications. I just operate in this tiny area. So I know all of the hormone therapy options, but my advice to you is to pick two things that you can write on a prescription pad. So you try the first one and you know, the majority of women, 75% will be happy with what they start on. And if it's not great, try the second one. And if you've tried two options and you're having a difficult time controlling symptoms, then that's an absolutely appropriate referral. Um, I have avoided trade names in writing on this presentation. 
Um, but these are some common regimens that I use on a daily basis. The first one being estragel, one to two pumps with progesterone. The second one being an estradot or climera patch with progesterone, um, estrace with progesterone. A combined pill might be something like trade name Angelique or trade name Actavel. Um, using Premarin and Provera is the old standard women's health initiative drug. Uh, this is covered by Pharmacare and is by far the least expensive option. Uh, combined Premarin plus Bazadoxifene, which is a CIRM, is an option. That's trade name Duaviv. And then Tibolone, trade name Tibella, is a one pill hormone therapy option. Uh, there is another gel called Divagel, which uh, can also be used. And when women have a uterus, when we're giving systemic medication by mouth or through the skin, we are always protecting the uterus. That's either with a levonorgestrel containing IUD, like a Mirena IUD, um, or an oral uh, progestin, like we talked about Provera or progesterone. You could theoretically use some of the other progesterone only pills. Um, or uh, obviously a progestin isn't required if somebody's had a hysterectomy. If somebody's had an ablation, it, we are still recommending a progestin. And to preempt the question, there's no guideline currently supporting the use of a Kylena 19 milligram um, IUD. Some of us do it. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, there is meta-analysis data to say that transdermal use of compounded micronized progesterone does not protect the endometrium. So once you've written a prescription for hormone therapy, we follow up within four months to assess for side effect treatment. I tell every patient that anytime we stop, start, skip, or change hormone therapy, you can have some bleeding or spotting. Uh, we usually investigate if that's prolonged for six months or somebody has endometrial disease risk factors. I reassess every person on hormone therapy annually, and we consider a trial off via either cold turkey stop or taper to see if they actually need their hormones anymore. Remembering that most vasomotor symptoms will um, abate within eight years, but some people will flash forever. And then we're of course ensuring ad adequate screening. And I get the question all the time. We do not have a current maximum length of use. There is no five-year rule, 10-year rule. This is an individual conversation between the patient and her prescriber based on her how symptomatic she is. And the one thing I continue to highlight is the relationship with breast cancer. Um, okay. So that is sort of our general overview patient. I have a couple more. Uh, this next one is a healthy 65-year-old woman who presents with low libido. Everybody's favorite on the day sheet, right? Uh, she's quite healthy. She tries to be sexually active with her male partner, but sex is very painful. She has tearing, bleeding. She's actually quite scared of, of the pain now. She's no interest in sex. Um, she says that she enjoys masturbation. She can achieve an orgasm with herself or with a, with a vibrator. She hasn't tried a lubricant other than coconut oil. And she comes to you saying, maybe I should try that. Um, and wants to know if she should, of course, have her hormones tested. So this, I'm trying to represent in this case, uh, a patient who has GSM. And we all know what this is. This is a, a newer term for vulvovaginal atrophy, pain with penetration, recurrent urinary tract infection, all from a low estrogen state on the urogenital epithelium. And it can affect everything. And it's my favorite to treat the women who have recurrent UTI, who have had, you know, 15 cystoscopies and a permanent phosphomycin prescription, and you put them on some local estrogen and it all stops and uh, they love you for forever. So non-hormonal treatment is great, you know, for people who are having sex, they're using a lubricant, which is water or silicone based, and then a moisturizer can be used non-hormonally for daily use, dryness with sitting, wearing pants, walking, cycling, etc. Uh, a lot of women benefit from using a dilator or a vibrator to, to maintain their vaginal caliber. But the bottom line is that putting local hormones, which are non-systemic on the target tissue um, works the best. And so we know that estrogens and androgens can improve the tissue quality 
um, improve thickness and elasticity and moisture. Uh, so if people aren't, if you're not treating vasomotor symptoms, we can use local hormones. So we don't give people oral medication in general or systemic treatments if it's just vulvovaginal issues. And, you know, this is hot off the press. When I first practiced, I think there were three options. Uh, now, as of uh, this coming few weeks, we have five local estrogens. Uh, so I will say the trade names on the recording. So the first one mentioned there is Vagifem. The second is Premarin Cream. That's the least expensive. The third is the S-String, which is vaginal, worn vaginally and changed every three months. The fourth is Estragyne. And the fifth is a new medication called Invexi, which is an ultra low dose 17 beta estradiol soft gel suppository. And the important point here is that there is no progestin required uh, because this is not a systemic medication that's going to activate the endometrium. But of course, we now have lots of other options too. Uh, the one on the left is vaginal prasterone, trade name Intrarosa. These are daily plant-based ovules uh, that are basically an inactive hormonal precursor that within the tissues are metabolized to estrogenic and androgenic effect. Um, and we do not see sustained estrogen or testosterone levels in the serum. So those of us that do a lot of breast cancer medicine, this would be one of our go-tos in this population if we're going to select something. And the other option is ospemaphine, which is actually an oral medication by mouth to treat vulvovaginal atrophy. It is a CIRM. It is very agonist to vagina, bone, and um, to vagina and bone, which is great. But it is antagonist to breast endometrium, uh, and this can work well. It is a more expensive option, being newer, um, and there are some drug drug interactions that we have to watch with this. Uh, but this can be an option for people who aren't able or aren't willing to vaginally administer medications, which is a higher percentage of the population than you would think. Okay, case three is a healthy 77 year old who was referred to me with severe new onset hot flashes. She's noticed that these are getting worse, that these are sort of suddenly appeared and are getting worse at night. Uh, she's quite healthy. She's noticed her BMI has drifted down as her appetite is sort of slowed. She hasn't had vaginal bleeding, but has some generalized pruritus that she's putting maybe some calamine lotion on. And she's read about hormone therapy and wants a prescription for hormone therapy. And so the point of this slide is that not all hot flashes are menopause, right? And so we always have to have in the back of our minds, the internal medicine hat on, what else could this be? And there is a big long list of things that can cause flushing. And some of these are sinister causes. And every once in a while, we pick up a lymphoma, a leukemia, uh, severe uncontrolled diabetes or thyroid disease. Um, and it's important that we understand that we're not just throwing hormones at every flush, particularly because we know, again, that we are not prescribing first start hormone therapy for women over the age of 60 or who are more than 10, that 20 shouldn't be there, more than 10 years from their menopause onset. And that's because if you give hormones to a 70 year old who hasn't seen estrogen in a long time, you are certainly increasing the risk of cardiovascular disease, stroke or clot. So we do not do that. So this patient needs a workup. She does not need hormones. I think this is my last one. This is a 45 year old woman who presents with significant vasomotor symptom and sleep disturbance, who's recently completed treatment for locally advanced estrogen receptor positive breast cancer with surgery, sentinel node, and chemotherapy and RADS. Uh, she's 45. Her last menstrual period was five months ago, mid chemotherapy cycle. She's been recommended to start on an aromatase inhibitor. She's otherwise healthy. Her friend said, well, you're in menopause now. I'm taking hormones. You should do that too. I feel amazing. And so she comes to your office and says she'd like a prescription for hormone therapy. And this is important. Breast cancer survivors on our current Canadian guideline, despite whether they're estrogen receptor positive or negative, are not a current candidate for systemic hormones. Now, vaginal hormones, that's a different story, but we're not giving people oral or transdermal systemic hormones if you've had a breast cancer. 
And the reason for that is because we know that it can increase the risk of recurrence or death from disease in randomized control trial data. A lot of people will try herbs and I get this question all the time, but the bottom line is that there is a placebo effect which wanes, people feel good, better for three months, and then they stop working. And I tell people to save their money because the bottom line, this is compared to 0.5 of uh, 17 beta estradiol orally, which is a tiny dose. And we still see that they, it outperforms uh, the placebo effect of botanicals. But for our breast cancer patients, we actually have options and they are bird. We have more and more options. This is a brand new hot off the press a uh, guideline from the Menopause Society. We are using um, antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications. Venlafaxine is the best studied in this population. Uh, we can use gabapentin, and I find it works the best for nighttime symptoms. I've never taken somebody up to 2,400 milligrams, but the clinical trials do. Um, and oxybutynin, which we know as an overactive bladder medication, actually has good results for people with moderate to severe vasomotor symptoms. And currently on this new guideline, we are no longer recommending the use of pregabalin or clonidine uh, due to adverse effects or poor evidence for their use for controlling vasomotor symptoms in a non-hormonal way. And this is just really exciting. This is coming soon. We are about to get the first non-hormonal targeted vasomotor symptom drug, which is called a neurokinin B antagonist. It's called phasolinotant. It is coming soon. It has a US FDA health approval and we're um, looking to see the Health Canada approval soon. This is targeting hot flashes where they're made in the brain um, by um, blocking the neurokinin B receptor. And so this is gonna be a breakthrough for people with estrogen receptor positive disease. So I know that I tried to do uh, 700 slides, <laughs> Caitlin, in 30 minutes. These are some of my favorite resources. Uh, in Victoria, we've put together a, a great website that has a ton of resources. I did the sexual function and the menopause pages. There is a free app from the Menopause Society that you can put on your phone. And this link at the bottom is an amazing uh, Canadian Family Physician article, two pages, how to handle menopause. Um, and and these are a, that's a great resource. And then for people for their general knowledge, this is all very self-explanatory. Uh, but these are some of the tips and tricks. I can't harp enough about abstinence from alcohol. It is bad for breast, bad for mood, bad for weight, bad for sexual function, um, and it is bad for vasomotor symptoms. And uh, sleep, the importance of moving our body, following screening guidelines, and of course, um, considering a meditation and or gratitude practice in this one life. And I'm thrilled to take any questions. Thank you so much for the invitation. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Mills. Um, we have a we have a, a lot of audience participation here. So um, let's start with um, can the levonorgestrel intrauterine system be used for the full seven years to protect the endometrium or five years? That's a great question. I think uh, so. First of all, that's acknowledging the change for, with the World Health Organization and the FDA that has moved the labeling of that device to seven or eight years for contraception. Uh, but we recognize that some of the contraceptive effect is the foreign body effect in the endometrium. Uh, so right now I'm recommending, especially if people have risk factors like an elevated BMI, um, that I, I am recommending in my practice that if we're using it for endometrial protection, that we're replacing it in five years. I just replaced one in a 72 year old the other day. It is covered in British Columbia, regardless of your age. <laughs> Good to know. Um, okay. Uh, if a patient is using norethindrone for managing menorrhagia, can transdermal estrogen be added safely? Great question. So that's talking again about using uh, getting creative with our progestogens, and it absolutely can. So if it's good enough for, um, you know, endometrial suppression of menorrhagia, it's, it's good enough for hormone therapy. Remembering that menstruating women see very high circulating levels of estrogen. And then in men, if you have a truly menopausal patient, uh, those estrogen levels, what you're adding back are very low. Uh, so I, that's great. We do that all the time. Hence why the smoking and uh, migraine headaches, et cetera, are not absolute contraindications. Exactly. You're giving back a fraction of what they 
more recently had around. Um, okay, how long can you safely use vaginal estrogen without oral progestin in women with an intact uterus? Great question. And I think the confusion comes is that if people actually dig into the drug monographs, they will see a recommendation to use a progestin. The important point is that if you are using these medications as prescribed, often loading the dose for two weeks and then doing twice weekly, you can use those medications indefinitely and should for many women without a progestin. So there is excellent endometrial safety data. I've seen 100 year olds who have been on a vaginal cream for 50 years. If you scan them, their lining is two millimeters. I think where we get into trouble is that uh, some people may be using more than what we think. Uh, so it's good to check in with your patient because if you hand them a tube of cream, they can apply as much as they want. And I have seen people who say, I just take my Vagifem every single day. And that's, that's not the recommended dosage. So if we stick to that indefinitely, um, I have lots of 90 year olds in my practice who take vaginal estrogen. And would you say like when in doubt, I mean, progesterone being very safe, especially you talked about um, micronized progesterone prometrium, um, you know, it doesn't have any uh, increase in clotting risk. So if, if you're wondering, if you're worried about it, then sure, put them on a short course, you know, 14 days of prometrium once every three months, for example, if, if you're concerned about it, do you ever find yourself doing that? I, I rarely do. I feel like oftentimes if you had enough endometrial stimulation, you would get some bleeding. Um, and then I, I rarely do, but I think the downside is really low other than the fact that pro micronized progesterone is very expensive and right. often not covered by, you know, it's not covered by a lot of different, um, extended benefits, depending on your age category. And they often won't sell you actually just the number of tablets they want you to buy the whole, the, the pharmacy will give you the whole box, which is 30 yeah. or, or more. Okay. Uh, I digress. Um, what is the treatment for genital urinary syndrome of menopause in patients with past or current breast cancer? Good question. So the SOGC, the Canadian Menopause Society, ACOG, they all have guidelines which support the use of local hormone therapy in these patients. I really encourage people to have a dialogue with their medical oncologist. I am wary of young women with bad, aggressive disease. You know, I don't want to do anything to make their breast cancer risk worse. You know, for the woman who's 70 and she had breast cancer 15 years ago, she's long been graduated from the cancer agency. That's, that's a very different story. I mean, I, that's very um, safe to use. Um, we certainly have a caveat around women who are on an aromatase inhibitor, which the whole job of that drug is to block as much circulating estrogen as possible. So I would probably prefer the vaginal prasterone, um, in those situations. Um, but for women who have had a, a remote history, certainly I have no hesitation and you are backed up by guidelines if you prescribe that for your patients. But if you have somebody who's in active treatment, then I think it's a great conversation to have with their medical oncologist. Okay. Um, and this is asking about HRT um, in perimenopause with vasomotor symptoms. So I think probably how you managing these patients that are having sporadic menses, maybe every three months, and in between they're having hypoestrogenic symptoms. Uh, what do you recommend that they're not yet menopausal? Yeah, that's a great question. So we need the progestogen um, to protect the uterus if people are not having any shedding of the endometrium. But if you have somebody, I see this a lot, people that are actually regularly menstruating who have significant vasomotor symptoms, um, remembering that, you know, you can have a very high follicle stimulating hormone level and still bleed. Um, so if people are bleeding and shedding their lining, uh, you can give them estrogen to take. Uh, I find most, the more common scenario is people in perimenopause are struggling with bleeding control. So then we're, uh, you know, a favorite would be placement of a progestin containing IUD, control the bleeding. Uh, it can sit in there for five years, adding estrogen on top. Uh, and some people will use estrogen intermittently because we know that their vasomotor symptoms might fluctuate a little bit um, as their hormone levels are fluctuating as they're trying to, to get to menopause. And so I have some patients who have a bottle of gel, 
And one month might use it 25 times and the next month may feel like they don't need it. Um, as long as you're either shedding the lining um, a minimum every three months or you're protecting it with a progestin or IUD, um, then you can add estrogen on top. And it's common for people to get vasomotor symptoms uh, before the period has stopped. Okay. Um, a lot of questions for you. Clearly, Sorry. people are really engaged in your talk. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Dr. Mills. That was excellent. My pleasure. Very practical. So many really helpful tips that we can just take to our practice tomorrow. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation. So um, a couple of housekeeping slides, and then we'll be finished here um, on the website under physician resources, click on our symposium, and that's where you will find um, the talks. Give us a little bit of time to upload them. We always get lots of questions. Like in the first week, we just, I actually like edit them on iMovie, <laughs> put them up there. So just give me a little bit of time. Um, and then um, in terms of swag this year, we went with these um, environmentally um, friendly uh, and sourced um, uh, reusable straws, and they are going to be mailed out to the address that you entered when you enrolled for the conference. Um, and then finally, thank you so much for coming. I ask one thing of you, please, please, please fill out the survey. It's very quick. We use the feedback. We take it very seriously in terms of improving next year's symposium. Um, subject suggestions, feedback for speakers, it really means a lot to us. So if you could take just a few minutes and fill out that survey, it really means a lot to us. Um, but thank you so much for coming. We had over 200 people enrolled today, joining us from BC, Alberta, and other locations across Canada. So hello to all of our colleagues. Enjoy the rest of your day and take care.